All right, everybody's going to Mars. That's the thing I wanted to talk about with you this morning. Everybody's going to Mars, which is cool because I'm all down for, like, everybody going to Mars. But, like, we're in this space race now because we got the Cold War going on with China. What's up, Jay? That's perfect. The timing on that was perfect. Jay, welcome to the family. Mom's got the knives for you. Everybody's going to Mars, which is, you know what? Here's the thing. I'm happy. I love space exploration. I love to get out there, but it's kind of funny that the only time that everybody gets in a space race is when there's like a cold war going on. And we're like in another kind of cold war going on with China right now. Russia's not too far behind like this China Russian kind of like mix now versus America. Right. So now everybody's got to go to Mars. We got to get out. We got to do this thing. Why can't we all work together as one world? Can we can we just drop all the, the political stuff? And can we just, like, work together as a human species? We're just, like, infinitely small, floating on this little blue dot in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> we're infinitesimally small. We think we're so big and important. We're just stranded on this little blue dot. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful blue dot that we keep ruining. But, like, we got to we gotta work together. And, 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 like, just think, if we all took the power of our minds together as a collective species... And we're able to use that collective knowledge to, to explore would be fascinating. What do you think, fam? <laughs> so here we got the the United Arab Emirates launching their first rocket, I think. Or, or, or they're going to Mars and they're putting a probe on it. So Why? let's watch this. Block. Here they go. All right. There is the, the United Arab Emirate rocket going to Mars with a probe on it. That was like, hey. All right, cool. Good for you guys. All right, there they go. Okay, great. Then, now, we got China with the Tianwen-1, which has, which is very ambitious, by the way. They've got a lander, a, a, a rover. Uh, it's like three in one, and a, like a probe, all in, all in one. That's... Wow. Okay. China's like got that hubris right now. They're like, China's the best. We got to do the best. Kind of reminds uh, uh, of America, like in the fifties, you know, like they, they're, 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 they're getting that like power. They're like, come on, China. That's what, so they're like, we got to do everything. <laughs> so here's their rocket. China number one in FG. The rockets all look slightly different from one another. Very interesting. There it goes. China's rocket, short and stubby. <laughs> Lots of thrusters. That almost looked animated right there. So there they go with their very ambitious uh, Mars launch. So I think because they're doing so much, mm, they might have some issues with that. Uh, and then, then we have the U.S. America, Eight, and here's ours: seven, six, five, five, four. Engine ignition: two, one, zero. Very Falcon, uh, the countdown to Mars continues. Falcon Elon Musk esque design. To the red planet. There we go. Now we have like this little drone on there, which it's going to be the first thing, first uh, flight on Mars, first vehicle flight. They're calling it a helicopter. It looks kind of like a little drone. And, um, America, <laughs> we're doing the first vehicle flight. So this is going to be interesting. I wanted to look a little bit onto that. Here's what it, here's, here's an article here from BBC on this craft that, that is on Perseverance, which is, which is our rocket here. Um, Sky says, who thinks it will fly? I'm skeptical. Yeah, I mean, the atmosphere is very different on Mars. So it should be should be interesting to see what happens. I, I'm very intrigued by it. This is Ingenuity, and it's going to Mars. NASA hopes. So Ingenuity is the name of this little uh, drone copter uh, thing. Perseverance is the name of the rocket that's sending it there. It will give us a different view of. She, that was a little creepy to see her like, Bleh! 
<laughs> like it was a little bit like uh, I, this is not a great transition. That's that's not nearly as good as the transitions here on this channel, by the way. Let me just say that. Let me just say that. And allow us to study cliffs and craters and all the other places that rovers like this one simply can't get to. It's got these carbon fiber blades and they can spin eight times faster than the blades on a helicopter here on Earth at around 2,400 revolutions per minute. It's got solar cells, batteries, two cameras, one black and white and one in color, computer systems, navigation systems, all of this in a helicopter that's only the size of a chihuahua. What? It's so small, it's actually traveling in the belly of another piece of- But hopefully not as annoying as the chihuahua next door because that thing never stops barking and I just want to punt it. Yes, I said it. I did. If you had a dog that barked all 24-7 next to you every single day of your life, you'd want to do that too. Even if you're an animal lover, you would. So let's hope it's not like any comparative, you know, only in size is this like a chihuahua. If it were like it in demeanor, I would probably want to bro blow this thing up right away. But it, it's just they're talking about, you know, comparatively in size. Of scientific equipment yes, that NASA effigy. is sending yes. to Mars, all part of its 2020 mission to the Red Planet. Now, because Mars is so far away from Earth, there's too much of a delay for you to be able to control this thing with a joystick. So, what's happening is scientists are sending commands way, way, way in advance. So, essentially, this machine will be taking off by itself, flying by itself, and landing by itself. And flying there won't be easy. The atmosphere is a hundred times thinner than it is uh -huh. here on Earth. See, but I if know it something. Works, we could be sending more flying robots to Mars in the future, and possibly using them as scouts for human missions one day. Yeah, so very interesting there. What's up, Strike? Welcome to the stream, bro. And uh, this was a little piece here about the vehicle on Veritasium, which I absolutely love this channel. If you are not subscribed to this dude, this guy is awesome. So let's I'm learn a little bit Jeff about Propulsion the Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and I'm here to see the first drone that's gonna fly on another planet. It's the mm. Mars helicopter. Mm. So, so, this is our baby. That, no way. Yeah. That thing right there is the actual machine that is going to take off and land on Mars. So two rotors, two rotors and a solar panel on top. It is the size of a chihuahua. They are correct. It, 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 <laughs> it is. Look, it's, it's chihuahua sized. It's going with the Mars 2020 mission. That is the Mars helicopter. This will be the first powered flight in another planet. <laughs> How I mean, awesome this is, is that. Now, it's necessary to say first powered flight because ah. in 1985, the Soviet Vega missions deployed two <laughs> helium balloons on Venus. They transmitted data for over 46 hours while floating at an altitude of 54 all right, kilometers all right. in Venus's. All right, it's a balloon, though. I mean, we're, we're talking flight and in, in, we're not talking balloon flight. We're talking like vehicle powered, amazing flight. You know, this is like fake flight. Fake flight. <laughs> Fake flight. Dense atmosphere, which at the surface has a pressure of over 90 Earth atmospheres. In contrast, Mars has very little atmosphere, only around 1% of Earth's. Flying this kind of uh, helicopter is equal Dude, to I hope this thing just doesn't turn over and crash on the ground. At <laughs> like, you don't, know, you don't hear about many helicopters at 100,000. I think 40,000 feet is probably the record. I checked. 40,000 feet is the record altitude reached by helicopters on Earth. 85,000 feet is the highest a plane has ever flown. On Mars, the <laughs> air is even thinner than that. Right, in terms of density, is 1% of what you have in this room. So in this room, a cubic meter of right, air is about a kilogram. Yeah. The same cubic meter on Mars will be about 15 grams to 18 grams. So that's. <laughs> so you're, you have to push a lot of air down. Yes, you gotta gotta get a lot of air flowing, and so yeah. the obvious uh, trick, if you will, is to uh, spin the blades faster. It can spin between 2,300 RPM and 2,900 RPM. That is fast. That is fast. Yes. 2300. Here I'm trying to work out exactly how fast that is. So I looked it up and on Earth helicopters I've got computer fans that rotate faster. Come on, NASA. Just typically spin their rotors at around 500 RPM. So the Mars helicopter will have to spin its blades 5 times faster. But there are some limits. You know, you really we really don't want to get the tip Who's of the paying blade these guys? The speed of sound. 
because because then you, shock waves and all and you get all kinds of funky aerodynamics and you know transonic flows and things like that. So you don't want to go there. So we, in our designs, keep the tip mark numbers down to below about 0.7. So 70 percent the speed of sound. Yeah, so it's very conservative. I see, Sky. One I'm glad you're paying attention. Of flying on Mars is that gravity is only 38 percent of what it is on Earth. Even so, making the craft lightweight was essential. Keeping the mass of this vehicle contained during the entire design process has been the major challenge. Every single part had to be considered. The entire vehicle is less than 1.8 kilograms. Wow. Less than four pounds. That's, That's about crazy. the same as this laptop. The blades are uh, foam core with carbon fiber layup. Each of them is about 35 grams. The, wow. Yes, the, it's quite light. The biggest thing besides the atmosphere is the dust too. So, I mean, and the winds are ridiculous. So they're gonna have to be careful when they're when they're launching this thing, but this should be pretty cool in mapping out Mars uh, a little bit and, and, and also getting in certain places that, you know, most of the rovers would not be able to get and be able to traverse Mars you know, a bit faster than a rover would. So, you know, that is pretty, pretty yes. cool. <laughs> Whoa. 35 grams is the mass of a six quarters. Weird Think spot to start back up. Two 35 gram blades <laughs> lifting an 1800 gram helicopter by spinning 40 times per second in just 1% of Earth's atmosphere. How long can it fly for? Mm, good it's question. designed to, uh, to fly up to 90 seconds. A yeah. minute and a half of flight. Yes. To yeah. me, that. Ah, come on. Like, I'm very disappointed in hearing that. Sounds like forever when you're talking about another planet flying autonomously by itself. It does not sound like forever to me. 90 seconds? Why does that sound like forever? That doesn't sound like anything to me. Come on, we can do better than that. NASA! First off, my PC fans spin faster than your than 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 your amazing, wonderful helicopter drone, and now we only get ninety seconds in one one hundredth Earth's atmosphere. I mean, come Red on, species, like, that's, right. that's a long time. That is. Yeah. One of the questions I had was, is it? Why didn't they use a quadcopter design? Ah, well, because on Mars the blades have to be so long that the whole craft would barely fit on the rover. Two counter-rotating propellers provide the simplest design. They also generate lift more efficiently when stacked on top of each other. And what are you gonna get for, what <laughs> kind of information can you get in 90 seconds worth of flight? You know? Okay, we're lifting up now, we're launching. Great, we're launching. Okay, we're, we're hovering, we're moving slightly north. Uh-oh, we gotta, we gotta get back. We gotta get back, land it, land it, land it, land it, land it. <laughs> All right, can we collect that data? Uh, sorry, sir. <laughs> right, 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 right. The bottom rotor sees the... That's true, David. You got a point, buddy. Compactified flow. The top one pulls it. The bottom one sees sort of a more concentrated flow. Right. So the bottom rotor actually can do better than if they were separated apart. But how do you test a helicopter designed for conditions on Mars on Earth? What would happen if you just took your Mars helicopter and you tried to take off on Earth? It would just make a lot of noise. Yeah. Right? And it probably wouldn't get the full head speed either. <laughs> because of how much atmosphere we've got. Exactly. It's like trying to swim in a thick soup. We have a really amazing chamber here on lab called the 25 foot space simulator. And in that chamber, you could simulate any kind of atmosphere you want. You can go to Martian pressures. Oh, that's air, awesome. Pressure, whatever you want. But that Dudes. only took care of half of the problem. That was the aerodynamic. I hope he does something There's on that. That'd be cool to gravity. see that chamber of we wonders. A way to fake Mars gravity here on Earth. And the best way that we could figure out to do that was a gravity offload. Gravity offload just means pulling up on the helicopter, so it only has to support about 38% of its weight. Just like Okay, now let's simulate Jupiter's gravity. <laughs> Please stop! <laughs> like it will have to do on Mars. And effectively, it was a high-tech fishing reel. So taking a brush DC motor, a reaction torque sensor, and a pulley, uh, mounting that a couple stories in the air, and then attaching a fishing string to the top of the helicopter that would tug the necessary force required to offload the differences in gravity. Do you imagine the, fishing line. the yeah, amount of pressure fishing line. that would yeah. be able to that like, have like, to don't you withstand? Want that's perfectly rigid, so as soon as you apply the torque, it gets applied to the craft? Right, right, and we did a lot of testing with different vendors to find out which fishing line had the best spring constant for us. What does the helicopter sound like? I imagined that in 1% of Earth's atmosphere, the helicopter- Hold on, we got a live recording of it. Let's hear it. Whoa, that is crazy. 
That is an amazing recording. <laughs> this helicopter would be pretty quiet. Yeah, you're still at 1%, but it's still real loud. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, we have audio recordings of it, too. Uh, but it's, it's, I would characterize it more Go and loopy like, from uh, the diet. Bah! My apologies. Something like that. <laughs> when the gravity all flow system was working and the chamber was pumped down, <laughs> the helicopter <laughs> thought it was on Mars. It felt like it was on Mars, the helicopter. How do you actually steer this thing around and drive it? So the way helicopters work is they have um, something called collective and cyclic. So what collectives do is they change the pitch on the blades uniformly. So throughout the entire revolution, if you move the collective, the blades will change their angle, of, change attack. angle of attack, you'll get more lift. So that's basically what you would provide you heat control, right? You pitch more, you go up, pitch less, you, go, you come down. But then... They need this guy for flight uh, on the flight team over at Cloud Imperium. It, <laughs> it, it modulates the pitch as it goes around. So it can pitch a little bit more here, less here, so it kind of like modulates. So what that does is it provides an asymmetric torque, right? When you're pitched up there, you get that additional torque. Now you get it. <laughs> right in effigy. The system, you actually get it. Oh, dude, I care about Mars. I cared, damn. Afterwards. Space so exploration is awesome, dude. Um, I care. <laughs> torque, the vehicle wants to start pitching or rolling, right? So once it pitches and rolls, and you're doing it stably, you are now pointed in a direction and your thrust vector now has a component that's horizontal in the direction that There we go. So then you start translating in that direction. I've heard that <laughs> right. initially someone tried to fly it with a joystick. Yes. An early prototype. If you were sitting right there on Mars and you were trying to joystick it, what is it like? And it's almost unflyable. And the reason for that is that's what she said. Aerodynamics of when you want to command a roll to the left because you see yourself starting to move to the right and you start commanding a roll to the left, there's a delay aspect. So that, that delay effect makes it very, very difficult for a human to try and pilot it. <laughs> oh. You can't fly this from Earth. Because of the 20-minute kind of time delay, uh, so you have to really send sequences. So essentially... I would like to be in that study, Damon. And like 20 minutes later, it'll take off and do its thing. And right, <laughs> find out. The way this flies autonomously, it has onboard gyros, onboard accelerometers, <laughs> and onboard camera, and altimeter, and an inclin inclinometer. <laughs> and so using that sensor suite, real-time measurement, you know, against the terrain and of course the gyros and the accelerometers uh, sensing on board, uh, the real-time estimation of the state of the vehicle is made continuously, again, you know, hundreds of hertz, at hundreds of hertz. And then that's fed into the closed loop control algorithm that takes the estimated state and then generates the correction that's needed at the yeah, I mean, like, this is all fancy talk. It's great and everything, but for 90 seconds, you know, hey, and then you got to think about needing, like, a safe, stable landing area, too. They, they're they going to have to find areas where this thing can land to recharge. Are they going to land it back on the, the actual lander? Is it is it is it is it dedicated to always coming back to the lander? Or can this thing kind of, like, fly out, land, and then maybe fly out and land and keep going further? Probably has to go back to the lander, you know? So it might be centralized around this lander as a, as a charging station. And, you know, that will limit the amount of area that it can cover. So these are questions I would like to... Come on, Veritasium. Uh, uh, blade level, and then the blades are continuously being controlled. So when you see video uh, tapes of our successful flights, right, and if the vehicle looks dead calm, is coming up and hovering and going laterally, coming back, you know... The machines are working very, very fast and very, very hard. It just looks very calm, but yeah, so the, the blades are being continuously controlled. That is amazing. Yeah. How will it handle a gentle breeze? A lot of the movies depict... Uh, <laughs> dust storms. <laughs> depict dust storms <laughs> as being very aggressive on Mars. Uh, the truth of the matter is that 1% Earth's atmosphere uh, is very little matter actually hitting you. Always. I mean, you're using that to lift yourself. Exactly, exactly. So obviously... We, so there's enough to lift, right? But we also need to spin at 2,200 RPMs to be in the ballpark of lifting ourselves. We built our own wind tunnel. I know, David. That's what I said percent. earlier. How many fans was it, Teddy? 960 computer fans. So, But it, it, did, it did sound like a, like a jet engine taking off. So we built a fan wall array. It's called an open cr cross-section wind tunnel where you don't need the walls. Mm. Just the fact of having an array of fans, we are very confident of it being able to go at 11 meters per second. 
the, you in this vehicle. If I had known that, it'd be typical way, NASA though. If this thing just kind of, if it's not Elon Musk back. Job on, right? <laughs> How long does it take to recharge? If this we, is pure NASA, expect it to so, tip over the first day. day. At Mars, right. so but does that just mean teasing, that you could teasing. do one flight a day kind of thing, in theory? In theory, yes. By design, it can. What is the size of the battery? Translation, it won't. 40 watt hours total. That's equivalent to just three smartphone batteries. And get this, most of that energy isn't even used for flying. It has to survive uh, temperatures as low as about minus 80 to minus 100 degrees C at night. So we keep the batteries warm and we surround the batteries with our electronics board so the electronics boards also stay warm. We take approximately two thirds of energy just keeping things warm and warming things up to operate. Only one third of the energy is available for flight. Do you have insulation on there to keep it warm? Yes. When you look at the helicopter, right, you have the solar panel on top with the antenna, yep. and then next is the rotor system. And then bottom, what you see, this cube, is what we call the fuselage. You are seeing it now actually uncovered because you are seeing the last day of final, yep. we're recovering you know, for delivery to be integrated onto the rover. Okay, so usually you won't be seeing that. So the center oh, of it's the on cube a rover. is the okay. ring of batteries. Okay? I didn't there know that. There is space between the battery and the circuit boards that you That's see. cool. And then there will be a shell that we put on called the fuselage shell. And that will okay. close. Okay, this cool factor just went up to like a thousand right there. So this is going to be attached to a rover apparently. So that is awesome information. I didn't know that. So that means the rover will be able to drive around. The rover literally is the charging station. The drone is attached to the rover. This is getting much cooler now. Like co2 the gas around and so the enclosure itself we're using the co2 gas as the insulation material oh wow no aerogel no aerogel we did consider <laughs> it was in the it was in the game it was uh, it was in the consideration in the uh beginning and uh it turns out that just the co2 as um you know insulator itself was sufficient for us to close our thermal model right and so Guess why we wouldn't want to use aerogel if we have a choice. Wait. Yeah, there you go. You're <laughs> welcome to our team. Now, before the helicopter can experience the frigid conditions That's on Mars, awesome. first it has to get there. And that's I love this a reminder dude. that I not love only channel. is this an aircraft, it's also a spacecraft. It has to survive launch. It has to survive launch loads, which, you know, easily exceed about 80 G. You know, because of well, the vibration, the vibration of <laughs> ATG. Yeah. Then it has to survive the seven month trip complete with radiation. And finally, after pulling nine G's on entry into the Martian atmosphere, the helicopter needs to be deployed. This is going to be on the rover. Before you take off, does the rover like pick you up and put you down somewhere? Uh, we're going to be stowed underneath the rover on the belly pan on our side. Uh, and there's going to be several, uh, several sequences of firings of explosive devices to actually rotate us. I think the entry and, and the landing are the most difficult example, parts the of the mission. the very last thing the rover does is it's got us by this bolt, it's holding us, you know, mm -hmm. about this side, and then it goes, has to drop us, right? Yeah. So how do you undo a bolt <laughs> on, on a spacecraft? Just blow it up. You blow it up. Basically, it's uh, the materials, you know, undergoes a phase transition, which suddenly wow, that's the, the stress. Wow, that's got to be amazingly the, uh, precise to work. And makes the bolt break. Hmm. It's called a frangible bolt. Then once we're on the surface, the rover drives over us, it gets about 100 meters away, <laughs> and then we, we have a, about a two-hour uh, counter internally where we'll wake up after two hours, wait to hear some RF transmissions, and if we do get the, that link with the rover, then great. Our base station on the rover would issue the fly now command. First flight would probably be a mutual selfie, you, know, <laughs> you would think. This is, after all, the selfie age. Uh, um, so <laughs> I like that as the goal of the first flight. Yes, it is. In Go fact, up, no, you selfies. know, the best time to fly this is at 11 o'clock in the morning local time on Mars. And that, the reason for that is we would have come out of the night where we would have that time, a lot of that, that time in between from where it lands to where like it gets it, it, the the radio signals go out for the communication makes me feel like hearing the soundtrack of Pink Floyd like hello hello is anybody out there you know just not if you can hear me is there anyone <laughs> like I feel like that's the song to, you know stay warm but for that particular moment would have selfie drone says Merlin you could fly without risking brownout on the battery and then, you know, dropping the whole craft to the ground. Also, 11 o'clock is um, where the sun would have warmed up things, so we don't quite have to heat up as much 
And also, it's not late afternoon where, because of the warmth, the density has begun to drop. <laughs> it does. Okay? And the winds have begun to pick up. Now, what we will investigate is after we get the first couple of flights under our belt, I'm sure we will try to fly in the afternoon and you know do more exploratory things. But the most conservative thing we can do is to sort of pick a uh, mid-morning flight. So what is the purpose of this mission? The Mars helicopter is first and foremost a technology demonstration to prove <laughs> that we nice. can fly on another planet. The helicopter can take color photos and videos, but its purpose is not to make scientific discoveries. Instead, it is to help engineers figure out how to design and build aircraft for future missions. Very you can cool. imagine something that's about 30 kilograms carrying you know, a two kilogram science payload doing exploration. I you know, I actually dig that. I actually dig that that's kind of the uh, the agenda here because then we can get longer flight. We can get maybe uh, extended periods of flight and be able to cover more area. That That is pretty cool. Acting like a scout, like a small vehicle like this, scouting ahead for some future rover, or it could be a right. gadget that goes and picks up some kind of samples and brings it back to a central lander for more sophisticated analysis. Or it could be a completely standalone craft. That's maybe pretty cool. That are exploring. I, I really places dig that. Where humans and rovers can't get to easily. Mm. Um, so polar ice scarves, you know, right. sides of cliffs and so forth. Yes. So the real emphasis here yes. is to try to get back all the engineering data so that it can inform that future design. Flying on other planets will provide a new dimension in space <laughs> exploration. <laughs> An aircraft Caesar is Milan. faster and capable is, of covering no. more ground than a rover, like I'm red. and it can provide higher resolution imagery than an orbiting spacecraft. So maybe one day aircraft will be the companions of future dude. rovers or even astronauts exploring other worlds. Very cool, man. Very cool. If you aren't subscribed to him, do that. So that was my complete rundown this morning. I hope you guys enjoyed that of like my whole thought process towards our uh, everybody going to Mars, like the political things going around, you know, what, what's happening around the world right now, how everybody's rushing to Mars and then what our particular on Perseverance, what our rockets going to do, the objectives, uh, what Tianan one uh, China's rockets doing uh, the United Arab Emirates rocket is going to have just a probe on it. And uh, I thought I'd do like a complete kind of like run through of everything. So everybody got an idea of what's happening. I don't think in terms of like economically that it's very viable or important that we're going there or for the other countries. I think it's more of like a prestige type of thing, you know, like going back to the old kind of cold war vibes where like it was about who got there and what they did. And, you know, I think, it, I think it's more about that than any economic impact that we're going to see from going to Mars. But it was really interesting for me to kind of put, I hope, I hope you guys learned a little bit more about that. So I just want to put that out there.